The phrase I left off talking about was فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ First there's a fa in the ayah which means that if someone follows the guidance that I have sent فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَةَ Whoever followed my guidance then there will be no fear and no grief. The other thing that I didn't mention, I failed to mention about this ayah is Allah didn't say فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيكُمْ مِنِّي He said يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي There's a noon shadda you hear there. It changes the meaning a little bit. He's putting the condition that if and only if the guidance definitely has come from me. In other words, make sure that the guidance you are following is from me. It's not from anyone else. And in the language embedded is the implication, the possibility that there will be people who think they are following guidance, but they haven't actually verified and made sure, convinced themselves that they're following the guidance of Allah. So they're actually in misguidance. So when someone does claim to give you guidance on my behalf, when, you, when something is claimed to be guidance of mine, investigate it. Don't just you know, believe it with closed eyes. And this is something that is unique about our deen. Allah Azza wa Jal asks us, ask the kuffar to bring their evidences against the Qur'an. You know, the, the, the Christian or the Jew or other people of other faiths, they will legitimize their belief by saying, look, this is just my tradition. I belong to a Muslim tradition, or I belong to a Christian tradition, or a Jewish tradition, or a Hindu tradition, or a Buddhist tradition. That's who I am. And that's the, that's the culture I follow. I don't have to question it. That's just, you know, the way things are. They don't really look back and question it. But the Muslims are actually, this is one matter in which we're supposed to have so much proof that we actually challenge others to criticize our belief. That's one way of looking at it. The other thing is, when we do find people of other faiths challenging Islam, and making criticisms of Islam, we shouldn't be offended. Actually, we should welcome their challenges. You know why? Because they're doing what Allah challenged them to do anyway. <laughs> the Allah Azza wa Jal opened the door to that attack. He said, bring, bring forward your criticisms, your evidences. Right? That, that's the nature of our religion. It's, you know, in modern, uh, the, the modern person, the, the, the modernized rather person, postmodern person, thinks of himself as intellectual and thinks that religion is something that people accept when they don't think about things. They shut their mind off and that's when they accept religion. Like you know the modern philosophical term, the opiate of the masses. Right, it's, it's like a drug, it's a high. You don't want to accept reality, so you believe in these you know, superfluous, these fantastic things like angels and paradise and hell. That just means you can't deal with reality on the ground. This is what the atheist or the agnost will tell you. Right? But Islam on the other hand, our religion, the attitude we have is, no, we're not believing in this religion with eyes closed, we believe in, we believe in this deen with eyes open. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ I call to Allah with eyes open. So Allah says, if verify that it's guidance from me, إِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Then whoever follows that guidance, they get, they get two benefits here and in the akhirah. And that's something beautiful about this ayah, we'll start with that. Is that the, the, the phrase, there will be no fear on them, or there is no fear on them and they won't be the ones to grieve, this phrase has benefits in dunya and has benefits in the akhirah. It has two kinds of benefits. Once in, in this worldly life and in the next life as well. So Allah is guaranteeing the Muslims will not be in a position of fear here and no grief here nor in the next life. And we have to, that needs a little bit of qualifying. So let's take it one bit at a time. You know in, in Arabic, in Quranic Arabic especially, every little word and every little detail counts. When Allah talked about fear, He talked about, first of all, He talked about fear first. And He talked about sadness and grief second. When He talked about this gift He's giving us, He mentioned fear first and sadness second. This also has benefits. Because that which is in more quantity is mentioned first. And that which is in lesser quantity is mentioned second. Why is fear more? Because fear is associated with the future. For all of us, what we are afraid of is things that haven't happened yet if it's sickness or the consequences of that sickness or it's the loss of a job or it's what's gonna happen with my children or what's gonna happen with this marriage or whatever, whatever, whatever. Everything that you fear is things, are things that haven't occurred yet. Fear is associated with the future. However, sadness is not associated with the future. Sadness is associated with the past. Things that have already happened make you sad. Things that haven't hap happened yet scare you. <laughs> After they happen, then you get sad. I'll give you a student example. You know, before the test, the student is afraid. After the test, the student is sad. <laughs> right after the result comes out. So there's this, the future, we, we, think, we think of fear in terms of the future, and sadness in terms of the past. Now the thing is, when you remember something sad, you become sad. 
But when you don't remember it, you move on with life. But fear, however, is always there. In small amounts and in big amounts, it's a permanent part of life. Actually, fear is a healthy part of life. The fear is the reason you get up early in the morning and get ready for work, because you're afraid of getting fired. Fear is the reason that you, you, know, you dress the way you're supposed to dress, because you might not meet certain standards. Fear is the reason you're studying for the exam that's coming. So fear even works for us in this dunya. Fear is the reason you might eat healthy, or might take care of your health, you know? So fear is a, is a part of a believer's life and even a non-Muslim's life. But Allah Azza wa Jal didn't say there will be absolutely no fear on them. The Arabic for that would have been لا خوف عليهم That would mean there is absolutely no fear on them whatsoever. Allah said لا خوف عليهم Which means for the most part there won't be any fear. Allah did not remove the possibility of fear altogether. Of course, in this dunya, believers might suffer a situation or be in a situation where they are afflicted with fear. But by and large, they will not fear like other people fear. They will not be worried like other people are worried. The other thing that's very powerful here, that I alluded to, I'm not going to give you all the notes from, my, from that lecture because it gets, gets a little heavy, but I'll give you some um, snippets from it. There's a difference between saying, in Arabic at least, there's a difference between saying, so, so and so fears, or there's a fear on him. So for example, this person fears is saying something else, and saying there's a fear on this person is saying something else. Now let me explain the difference to you subtly. When you say, for example, the child fears, that means the child has the feeling of fear inside of them. They're feeling afraid. When you say there's a fear on the child, it means that the child is in some kind of danger. Even if they're not feeling afraid. Now let me put it in terms of an example. In, uh, uh, think of a young child, a small child, playing with a snake. Right? And the child is not scared at all. The child thinks it's cute. It's playing with a snake. At that time, we say the child does not fear. The child does not fear. But there is a fear on the child. The fear on the child implies there's a danger on the child. In other words, now you tell me, which is worse? The child feeling afraid or the child actually having a fear on them? Which is a worse situation? Having a fear on them, because that's an actual danger afflicting them. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't say, لا يخافونا. He doesn't say they don't fear. He didn't say that. Actually, all over the Qur'an we find a quality of the believers is that they do fear. In this dunya and in the akhirah, on judgment day, believers are in fact afraid. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us the attitude of believers in this dunya, إِنَّا نَخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْطَرِيرًا You know, we fear from our Lord a, sad, a master, or a sad day, we're afraid of that day. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ Whoever was afraid of standing in front of their master, fearing, feeling the feeling of fear. You know, having that emotion is a good thing, it's a quality that Allah praises of the believer. You know, but on the other hand, and by the way, يَخَافُونَ يَهُمَّنْ تَتَقَلَّبُوا فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ They fear a day on which hearts will be turned and eyes will be turned. But on judgment day, Allah is describing, even though they will feel afraid, which is normal. I mean, the sun and the moon are colliding into each other. You know, the, ocean, the oceans are boiling over. Wild animals, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Wild animals are herded together. It's normal to feel afraid. But on that day, Allah is giving us this, this consolation, even if you're feeling afraid, no one thing. There isn't actually something to fear for you. There is no fear on them. You understand? In other words, even if they feel afraid, they're not in any danger. What a gift of Allah Azza wa in this ayah. Then he says, وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And it is not they who are going to be grieving. Now the hum here is important. The first implication of hum is Allah is hinting, there will be others who will be grieving. Not the believers though. So he's alluding to those who don't follow this guidance. And there's a very powerful lesson inside this ayah. A lot of times people refuse to follow Allah's guidance because they think if they follow the guidance, they won't be happy. Like the laws of Allah will make life difficult and harsh and we can't have any fun. You heard these kinds of logic before? Right? If we follow Allah's guidance, we won't be happy. Allah says whoever follows it, they're not gonna be the ones who, who end up in sadness. In other words, people who try to pursue happiness in anything other than Allah's guidance, will end themselves up in empty sadness. 
How many Muslims, I could tell you how many Muslims I personally know that used to be non-Muslim before. They were living the life of partying and clubbing and things that they thought were making them happy and all of them were, would say that you know when we finished a weekend of boozing off and partying and you know hanging off, you know, uh, suffering from a hangover, at the end of it I felt like disgusted with myself. I felt like something was empty inside of me. I wasn't happy. And every week I would try to do this, thinking this is gonna make me happy, I would even, I would only get sadder with my life. The only, the first time I felt peace in my life is when I came to Allah's deen. You know, how many of my friends are like that? That used to be this way, when Allah guided them to this deen, then they found happiness. So Allah is giving us this clue. The second thing inside this ayah is it's a verb. In other words, when fear was mentioned, Allah used a noun, khawf. When sadness was mentioned, Allah used a verb. Now I know this is kind of technical, but I'll, I'll be very brief. Nouns are permanent linguistically, and verbs are temporary. So when Allah mentions fear, He alludes to it, He talks about it in permanent form. But when He talks about grief, He talks about it in temporary form. Which is amazing, because fear is permanent in human psyche. But grief comes and goes, it's temporary. So that the emotion that is temporary is mentioned in verbal form. And the emotion that is more permanent is mentioned in permanent form. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون.